Good afternoon. <laughs> uh, welcome. I'm Bill Griswold, director of the Cleveland Museum of Art, and it is um, my particular privilege uh, to thank you for joining us today for this year's Dr. John and Helen Collis lecture on El Greco's Greek identity and highly distinctive modern style. Each year, the Collis Lecture brings to Cleveland an outstanding scholar in the fields of ancient Greek or Byzantine art. The program, which uh, is and, and uh, has been and remains a model here and elsewhere, is made possible through the uh, Dr. John and Helen Collis family endowment. And we are deeply grateful to the late Dr. John Collis, his wife, our wonderful trustee, Helen Collis, and to the entire Collis family for their visionary support of the museum and especially of these important public presentations of new scholarship in two exciting fields. Thank you so much for everything that you do for all of us. And of course, I also wish to thank the Hellenic Preservation Society of Northeastern Ohio uh, for their additional support. Uh, we are delighted that today, Charlie Barber, Donald Drew Egbert Professor of Art and Archaeology at Princeton University is here with us to, develop, to deliver a lecture titled, Wandering Off the Byzantine Path, El Greco's Modernism. Uh, but first, it is my pleasure to introduce Gerhard Lutz, who will, in turn, introduce our speaker. Gerhard joined the CMA in 2020, and in his capacity as Robert P. Bergman, curator of medieval art, he is responsible for the museum's large and exceedingly important holding of European art from the late third through the 15th centuries. He is also responsible for our renowned collection of European arms and armor favorites of so many families in Cleveland. Prior to his arrival, uh, he was curator at the Dome Museum Hildesheim in Germany, uh, where he also served as associate director. Gerhard received his MA and his PhD from the Technical University in Berlin. He has taught in Germany, Switzerland, and the United States, and his scholarship is widely published. His most recent exhibition at the CMA, which I hope everyone here had a chance to see was Riemann Schneider and late medieval alabaster. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Gerhard Lutz. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Bill, for this um, uh, lovely introduction. But uh, now it's uh, an extraordinary pleasure for me to introduce today's speaker, Professor Charles Barber. And however, as it is always the case with scholars who have calibrated experience, quality, and productivity in an ideal way, we are faced with an impressive curriculum vitae, which would not be appropriate to share today without taking too much time away from the speaker and his presentation. After all, we are all here to learn more about El Greco and his context. So I will try to show you in a few brush strokes the central point, points of Charles Barber's, uh, as we say in Latin, res geste. To do this, I will first proceed chronologically and then briefly introduce some of his works and research interests. Charles Barber received his PhD from the Courtauld Institute of Art at the University of London in 1989 with the dissertation Image and Cult, Studies in the Representation of the Virgin Mary in Early Medieval Art. His path then led him quite quickly to North America, where he was initially visiting assistant professor of art history at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign from 1993. His next place of activity poses the problem of correct pronunciation for someone coming from Central Europe. From 1996, Charlie was started as assistant professor of art history at the University of Notre Dame. Obviously, I'm always tempted to say Notre Dame. 
And from 2008, he was full professor there before moving to Princeton University in 2013, where he has been the Donald Drew Eckbert Professor of Art and Archaeology since 2019. In addition, Charlie Barber was visiting professor at the Oxford Center for Byzantine Research in 2013. If we now look at his lectures and publications, we should limit ourselves to a few numbers. I found 10 journal essays, 40 book chapters, 18 book reviews, 35 invited lectures, etc., etc. Not to forget his activity as member of numerous editorial and advisory boards and program committees. It seems more important to have a look at his book publications. In 2002, his book, Figure and Likeness, on the limits of representation in Byzantine iconoclasm, was published. And in 2007, Contesting the Logic of Painting, Art and Understanding in 11th Century Byzantium both major contributions to the field of Byzantine art history. Two forthcoming books are related to today's lecture. Eccentric Renaissance, El Greco, Michael Damaskenos, Georgios Glonzas will be published with Oxford University Press in 2024, and El Greco's Wisdom is expected for 2025. Another edited volume in progress is the Icon, a history from late antiquity to the present. Maria Vasilaki, a well-known scholar for regular attendees of the college lecture, is the co-editor of this publication. The anticipated publication date delayed by the Ukraine war sanction is also 2024, so there are quite a few new releases in the not too distant future to look forward to. One final aspect. As a university teacher, Charlie has also been advisor to numerous doctoral theses, including Justin Wilson, who is currently the Mellon Postdoctoral Fellow in Art History in the joint program with Case Western Reserve University here at the CMA. And of course, he is here today in the audience. But now we are looking forward to wandering off the Byzantine path, El Greco's modernism. So Charlie, the podium is yours. Thank you. I'm blushing. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, many thanks for that kind introduction, Gerhard. Um, I'd also like to extend my thanks to the Collis family, Helen, and everyone else for making this series on ancient Greek and Byzantine art possible. I'm greatly honored to have been invited to join a very distinguished list of speakers. I hope I can live up to the billing. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge everyone here at CMA who's helped to make my sort of journey here, my stay here so sort of comfortable and so beautifully organized. Um, it's a long list of names, so I will leave you in medieval fashion, anonymous, but f with my full gratitude. Um, okay. Ah, that's a good. There we go. Next, there we are. There's a big button and it does work. Uh, in my talk this afternoon, I plan to circle around a painting that will be very familiar to this audience. The Holy Mary family with Mary Magdalene that hangs upon the walls of this museum. I will put this to work as I ask you con to consider two aspects of El Greco's art. First, his relationship to his Greek and Byzantine roots, and second, his conception of his art's modernism as a Greek phenomenon. In calling attention to these related topics, I will seek to offer a fresh perspective on what we see and what we do not see in your painting. Let me begin with a very brief reminder of El Greco's story. First and significantly, El Greco always identified himself by his birth name, Domenicos Theotokopoulos. For his contemporaries in Italy and Spain, he was known by some variant of Domenico Greco, the Greek Dominic, Dominic the Greek. The implications of these acts of naming are manifold. 
but let me just note that all of them return us by significantly different paths to the artist's Greek identity. El Greco, and I'm going to use that name throughout as it's the more familiar one, um, was born on Crete circa 1540 and died in Toledo, Spain, in 1614. He had left Crete in 1567 to work in Venice. He was next to be found in the first years of the 1570s in Rome. He eventually settled in landlocked Toledo, where he remained until his death, and he lived there from 1577 to 1614. While there are gaps in this story, we can trace an artistic journey that saw his art develop from that of an ambitious icon painter down here with the Simi Chimesis, uh, the Cirrus Chimesis, which is a very elaborate version of a Chimesis image, the Dormition of the Mother of God, most notable for the little candelabra beneath her, which is a direct imitation of a series of contemporary uh, Renaissance models. Above, we move to the Modena triptych, um, late 1560s, where you're seeing his use of space, his treatment of color on the figure, the body develop, he's learning as he goes along. Over there on the bottom left, the Minneapolis um, purification of the temple, where you're seeing space beginning to be explored, interesting perspectives, and I'll pick up the nod to the figures in the bottom left hand, in the bottom right hand corner of the painting in a minute, until finally we end up with his mature style up on the upper uh, left there, where we have the more familiar El Greco, the one that seems to sort of cross time and place and to sort of test our expectations of what painting can be. It is a very distinct maturity. And this later work is really what's reflected to some degree in the painting that I want to circle around today. Um, you know, the, your painting is a beautiful example of work that we see from the 1590s. It doesn't quite end up where we're going to get to in the 1610s, but that's not our problem for today. Um, what I want to, though, draw attention to is the degree to which this kind of painting was valued at the time of El Greco's making of it. It became valued again in the sort of late 19th, early 20th century. But already from the 17th century, Domenico Greco's art, El Greco's art, was being marginalized, was being pushed aside from the central canon, particularly of Spanish painting. And I'm giving you one particularly sort of pungent example of this from um, the 1673 Practical Discourses where Giuseppe Martinez uses repetitions of the term extravagante to push El Greco to the margins of his account of Spanish painting. And it's worth just dwelling on this. I, there are going to be passages, times where I'm going to bring text into play, but um, I hope the text will be interesting enough to keep keep you interested. So what Martinez writes is, from Italy at this time there came a painter called Domenico Greco, said to be a follower of Titian, and that's what was said to be, is part of the slighting. The man established himself in the famous most ancient city of Toledo. He brought with him a style so outlandish, extravagante, that nothing as bewildering has ever been seen since throwing into confusion any expert attempting to discuss his extravagances, extravagancia, because some works are so at variance with others that they do not seem to be by the same hand. He entered that city with such great credit and in such a way that he gave people to understand that there was nothing in the world superior to his works. And it's true that he did do some things worthy of great esteem and which could count him among the most famous painters. He was of a very extravagant disposition. Like his painting, it is not known if he ever, if he ever made commission works because he said no price could be placed upon them and so he would lease them out to his purchasers and the owners willingly gave him what he asked. He owned a great many ducats, by, uh, but spent just as much on excessive ostentation in his house, to the point of employing sal salaried musicians to heighten his enjoyment of dinner. He did many works, but the only wealth he left was 200 pictures begun by his hand. He reached a great age with his reputation intact. 
He was an outstanding architect and very eloquent in his discourse. He had few followers because they did not wish to follow his doctrine as it was so fantastic and eccentric, extravagante again, that he alone could practice it with art. By this example, our student may learn to find the right and true road that so many exceptional artists have followed, both ancient and modern, because even though fortune favored El Greco along a different route, anyone wishing to imitate him will risk the probability that he would never achieve similar success. Martin is, is clearly not a fan of El Greco. Um, you know, the text largely speaks for itself. You know, he does touch upon, you know, El Greco has fame, he's eloquent, he has learning, but he's also idiosyncratic difficult, strange. How do we deal with him? His work is outlandish, it's inconsistent. No one should follow it, dear student. This is the wrong path to take. It was only in light of the radical onset of the modernism of Cezanne, uh, Matisse, Picasso in the first years of the 20th century, the later 19th century, that our Greco's strange art returned to favor and his works became widely collected. This is why we have so many El Grecos in North American collections. This was part of an embrace of a modernism and a genealogy for modernism. But what I want to invite us to do today is to set all of that apart, you know, aside. We, we, you know, we want to look afresh and to think again with our painting, not in terms of a pre-exemplar of 20th century modernism, nor as some strange offshoot of Spanish painting. We want to think about it in its own terms. So, let's look again at this piece. What do we see? The Holy Family, Mary, the Mother of God, Christ and Joseph, are set against a volatile backdrop of clouds and sky that grants them neither a particular place or time. This dislocation is further underscored by the overshadowing presence of the Ma Magdalene, whose deeper ruddy hues and shadowed flesh introduces a future full of foreboding into the family group. Her proleptic presence di directs the viewer to contemplate Christ's death and the body that she will anoint. But it is the mother of God who dominates the painting. Her extensive draperies fill the lower reaches of the canvas. She holds the tastefully naked Christ in her left arm while distractedly touching the fruit proffered by, Joseph, uh, by, by Christ to her. This has come from a glass bowl presented by Joseph as he reaches around Mary. It's a meditative study of a familiar dynamics that withholds itself from those who look at it. The Cleveland painting is in conversation with a small number of variants on the theme of the Holy Family found in El Greco's oeuvre. For example, a painting that is now in the Prado shows a woman who could be either Anne, the mother of Mary, or Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, viewing the Christ child asleep in the lap of the mother of God. Joseph, in a marginally more contemporary dress, looks on. Um, a naked John the Baptist holds a glass bowl of fruit and holds a finger to his lips, inviting silence. A second variant in Toledo uh, is, Toledo I should say just to make that clear, is focused upon a nursing mother of God. She is framed by a woman usually identified as her mother, Anne, and St. Joseph. Each of the panels offers a fairly self-contained image in which the family offers an intimate presentation of the incarnation and its part in the Christian redemption story. The Cleveland panel is arguably the most achieved of these roughly contemporary works. The figures fill a much larger proportion of the painting. The sky is in service of these bodies. It not only picks up and continues aspects of the colors below, but assists in framing the actors in this scene. The diagonal line of Joseph's body is echoed by the line of the clouds above him. The gray-hued hand of the Magdalene is found at the end of the funnel of dark clouds. The heads of the Marys are framed by a tinge and tailored blue ground. Brilliant light 
animates the draperies of the Marys. And this in turn calls attention to the lighter radiant flesh shared by Christ and the mother of God, drawing them yet more forward within the composition. The bowl of fruit, which is also caught in the light, is put to work as the source of the fruit that hovers ambiguously between the hands of Christ and Mary. A similar ambiguity may also lie in the woman that we have so far identified as Mary Magdalene. In that capacity, she foreshadows Christ's death, which will redeem the death introduced into the world by the fall of man. And this theme is reiterated by the fruit whose presence may allude to the fruit that tempted Eve, whose sin, the second Eve, that is Mary, the mother of God, will redeem. And it's tempting to suggest that the shadow figure behind Mary may also be connoted as the foreshadowing figure of Eve. El Greco has woven past, present, and future together within this complex painting. Earlier, I suggested that this work can help us to contemplate Christ's modernism. And now I need to begin to provide some understanding of what might be implied by this term. For help with this, we are fortunate to be able to turn to El Greco's own words. Two books from the shelves of his extensive library are particularly valuable in this regard. These were a copy of the 1568 edition of Giorgio Vasari's Lives of the Artists and the 1556 edition of Barbaro's edition of Vitruvius's 10 books on architecture. These were fundamental texts for a well-educated artist of the period. Now, El Greco's copies are now in the National Library in Madrid. And what makes them so interesting is that these works are filled with his own annotations and comments. So as we look up at this page, if you look at the right-hand margin, that's El Greco's writing. That is his reading, his thinking about these significant formative texts within the history of art. And they help us to begin to understand him, to understand what his project is about. These texts, it must be said, are often cryptic. They're often cut by margins. They are sometimes rather hard to analyze. Nonetheless, they have value. And I'm going to return to them from time to time because I think they can do something that we all try and do as art historians, which is to find appropriate language. And El Greco is here offering his own view of what his art might be. I want to begin on this um, page within his um, copy of Vasari. Um, it's a page that comes near the end of the chapter on the life of Agnolo Gaddi, who is a Florentine painter of the second half of the 14th century. Vasari, who's written this life, quotes and comments upon Cennino Cennini's assessment of the role of the Giotto in the history of art. And El Greco has underlined the following part of this. These are the very words of Cennino. That's the, that's the intro that sort of Vasari gives to his quotation. And then we're going to get to the bit that's underlined in the text that I've underlined for you there. To whom it appeared that even as those who translate any work from Greek into Latin confer very great benefit on those who do not understand Greek. So too did Giotto in transforming the art of painting from a manner not understood or known by anyone, save perchance as very rude, to a beautiful, facile, and very pleasing manner, understood and known as good by all who have judgment and the least grain of reason. This act of translation provoked a dismissive comment from El Greco. This is the comment in that margin. He writes this, if he, that is Vasari, knew how the Greek manner that he mentions really is, then he would judge it differently. For I am of the opinion that when one compares the two, the one which Giotto uses, that is the Latin manner, is simple in comparison to the ingenious difficulties that the one, the Greek manner, teaches. Here one needs to recall Vasari's famously derogatory remarks about the Byzantine tradition of painting in his life of Cimabue, in his life of Giotto, and elsewhere. 
Here well, there he presented Byzantine art, which was conceived as the maniera greca, Greek manner or style, as a straw man, and other to his construction of the development of a maniera moderna, a modern manner in Italian painting, the maniera latina that um, our friend El Greco is going to resist and fight against. For Vasari, the Maniera Greca was an art that was profoundly limited because its artist simply reiterated pre-existing works of art, repeating formulae and copies drawn from an existing tradition. In response, El Greco asserts that this Italian art was simple, dependent upon mathematical abstractions, the geometries of perspective and fixed proportion, and lacking the ingenious difficulties that the Greek manner could teach. The use of this term, of the terms in the phrase ingenious difficulties was deliberate and pointed. Both terms were important in the lexicon of Vasari himself. Difficulta, to use its more familiar Italian form, was a commonplace in Italian literary art and criticism. It has aristocratic overtones, suggesting a pleasure in engaging with intricacies in representation. Its application speaks to an elevated status for the artist. For Vasari, the artistic challenges overcome in Michelangelo's last judgment in the Sistine Chapel would exemplify the ingenious artist's ability. Ingenio is still more fluid. Options for its translation include genius, creative intelligence, innate talent, and ingenuity. The term had been applied to writers and intellectuals since the 14th century and began to be related to artists from the mid-15th century. For Vasari, this quality is an innate trait granted to its possessor and points to a mental capacity above the ordinary. Michelangelo again embodies this quality with his in Tuscan ingenuities. When appropriating these terms, and this is what El Greco is doing, he's appropriating them, he's taking them, and he's gonna use them for himself. El Greco is reiterating the values that they ascribe. Art should be deemed an elevated and intellectual practice. And this was a commonplace in the artistic literature of that period, which sought to affirm a high status for the artist. What is more notable is that El Greco seeks to use the idea of ingenious difficulties to construct an alternative to Vasari's own genealogy of art. In El Greco's comment, he is opposing the simplicity of an art that is built upon mathematical principles to one that delights in complexity. The first path is a Latin path mediated by the abstractions of that mathematics. The second offers ingenious difficulties and El Greco assigns a Greek origin to that. In drawing this distinction, El Greco is proposing that Vasari is wrong to identify the root of contemporary 16th century painting in the art of Giotto. Rather, for El Greco, the best contemporary art should trace its roots to the Greek manner that Vasari himself had rejected. Before turning to how this Greek manner is manifest in El Greco's painting, we need to pause and to consider what might be in play in this evocation of the Greek. In this regard, it's notable that throughout his career, um, El Greco signed his works in the Greek language. And this, of course, is a language that his Castellian audience might have been able to recognize, but might not have been able to read. An early instantiation of this signature is particularly telling. The Minneapolis version of the cleansing of the temple includes the portraits of such giants of the Renaissance as Michelangelo and Titian, underscoring El Greco's embrace of contemporary Italian painting. Given this, he nonetheless identifies himself in Greek. His signature reads, Domenicus Theotokopoulos of Crete, has made this, is the last part of that. Domenicos Theotokopoulos Chris Epie is a formulation that had great currency in the art of the 16th century. In particular, it points to Pliny the Elder's account of the ancient Greek painter Apelles in his introduction to the discussion of painting of the natural history. 
Here Apelles is, pray, is praised for turning painting into a continuous and developing process. An artist's work is always unfinished. This is captured by the Latin term faciebat, which is used in Pliny and in contemporary Renaissance artist signatures. Um, if you go to the exhibition on landscape with the prince and you look at the Jura, Adam and Eve, you'll see Faciebat being used there as one of the, as part of the signature. El Greco has translated this Faciebat into the Greek epie, and in so doing is returning it to its Greek ground. A second aspect of this signature is that El Greco invites his audience to remember that he came from Crete. This evocation of his homeland opens up a further consideration in El Greco's appeal to the Greek, for it has invited art historians to seek out the traces in his later works of El Greco's training in the traditions of the Byzantine icon. Learn, this was learned in his youth uh, all the way through into the sort of later 1560s, through to his probably becoming a master within the um, Scuola di San Luca on, um, on um, Crete. Uh, you know, the icon was his medium. And of course, it's a medium and a Cretan tradition that is beautifully represented here in this collection by your Akatantos icon, which is a gorgeous and impressive work. And it's lovely to see an Akatantos here in North America. This line of inquiry, this sort of sense of thinking with El Greco's icon painting origins, um, you know, is something to think with, because after all, part of his reaction to Vasari is cast in terms of Vasari's own rejection of icon painting. But it's also a theme that has been very important to a lot of art historians thinking about El Greco and El Greco's identity as a painter. So that, for example, art historians such as Lydia Harden and Mizgic and Stella Papadaki um, Oakland have argued for a persistent recourse to Byzantine compositional and iconographic parallels um, in, in El Greco's Spanish work. They encourage us to see in the burial of, uh, of Count Orgeth a traditional sort of evocation of the iconography of the rites of monastic saints Think about the cut up landscape ground that you're seeing, the way in which space is being sort of played around with abrupt shifts of color and so on. This is the kind of comparison that has been used to build a case for El Greco's Byzantinism. A second variant is a kind of practical Byzantinism that people like um, Andrew Casper have argued for, where they point to the Byzantine training of El Greco playing into his workshop practice, where we see uh, repetitions of favorite formulae that are brought forward, in this case, the Veronica, reproduced again and again. And there are certain aspects of his workshop practice that could be akin to that model of repetition but that would be to ignore the similar practices within the studios of Re Renaissance and Mannerist artists themselves. So again, I think it's slightly overloaded. I, I'm, I'm gonna work against this Byzantinism. Um, another example of this in recent literature would be Livia Stonescu, who's proposed that the use of Byzantine prototypes is central to the presentation of spiritual values in El Greco's art. And in a study that stresses a pan-Mediterranean reading of the artist, she argues for a long and abiding relationship with early Christian models and techniques in his painting. And as such, she proposes that, and I quote, in El Greco's Christ as savior, the referential ability of painting to recapture the essence of the earliest images of Christ from Mount Sinai, Byzantine mosaics and icons is overriding. People want El Greco to be Byzantine. And part of our work as historians is to think about where our desires and El Greco's work meet and where they might conflict perhaps. A second thread in this line is to also think about 
how this relationship with a Byzantinism might play into a reading of El Greco's art as having particular spiritual values. That is, his lingering Byzantinism feeds into a sense of his art being particularly spiritual. And, you know, for example, um, you know, Casper has written that an image that, that his works created as spiritual works, as religious works of art, um, serve as an image that can channel the viewer's attention to the prototype and at the same time proclaim its status as an artificial image that mediates that access. And this is leaning upon a very long tradition of thinking about the Byzantine icon. And again, I want to ask the degree to which that might be appropriate or not appropriate. Such an appeal to divine inspiration brings us to a slightly more intellectual rather than a strictly painterly strand in how one thinks about um, El Greco's relationship to Byzantium and to the Byzantine par, his Byzantine background. And one of the strongest statements of this is by Maria Evangelatu, who's argued that throughout his career, El Greco's art expressed profoundly Christian outlook. One aimed at a spiritual illumination that was rooted in a generic Byzantine Neoplatonism that belonged to the culture of his Cretan homeland. This spirituality is one that seeks to connect the human and the divine, the natural and the spiritual, the observed and the abstract. For Evangelatu, such, spiritually, such spirituality becomes manifest in El Greco's painting through the collapse of space, the mediation of light, and the negotiation of a relationship between the terrestrial and the heavenly domains. Hence, we, invite, we are invited first to pay attention to the precise details of the flowers and the lowest portion of this virgin of the Immaculate Conception, these are understood as markers of the natural world. We then ascend through the fragmented planes of the pictorial space towards the contemplation of a more ethereal atmosphere above. Here it's proposed that the sensible and intelligible modes of knowing find themselves reconciled and interwoven on the canvas. Evangelatu's description of El Greco's painting builds the case for a mystical and spiritual power to the artist's work that is grounded in a Neoplatonism that is deemed essential to his Byzantine identity. The possibility of the presence of such Neoplatonism is licensed by El Greco's possession of a copy of Pseudo Dionysus's Celestial Hierarchy. This important late fifth century text is a very significant Greek Christian um, spiritual sort of study of the relationship between the earthly and the heavenly. The significance of this, of this work for El Greco has been extensively discussed by David Davis, who argues for a more spiritual understanding of El Greco's art in light of this Neoplatonically inspired theology. A typical articulation of this interpretation reads, Philosophically, El Greco appears to reject the limitation imposed by the Aristotelian notion of form and matter as being inextricably fused and attempts in a platonic manner to realize the form by divesting it of matter. Accordingly, he rejects the Aristotelian concept of defining the ideal by reference to a naturalistic observation and relies instead on an ideal conceived in the mind, a vision of a higher reality. As such, these historians have asked us to identify the increasingly abstract and light-filled art of El Greco's later years with a spirituality that was rooted in the Byzantine tradition. These insistent retrospections to a Byzantine and early Christian past create a picture of El Greco that binds him to the long durée of the tradition of, of orthodox art and thought. And in this light, he remains permanently marked by his training as an icon painter. It's a background that provides him with visual formulae, a studio practice, and an understanding of the icon that is rooted in Neoplatonic and orthodox expectations. And yet much of this early history 
remains conjectural. The visual comparison is suggestive rather than necessary. It is a conversation that begs self-reflective questions as to what we might mean by Byzantine tradition or Cretan, and what expectations and desires we might have regarding continuities within an artistic identity. The case for a Byzantine path that leads through El Greco's life, thought, and work has been strongly opposed by other art historians. Their arguments can be quickly summed up in a quote from Fernando Marias, who argues that El Greco may have wished to be remembered as one of the finest Greek painters in his Italian century. He perhaps wanted to be the artist capable of bringing Greek painting radically up to date through his appropriation of Italian art and redirecting it along the path of Latin painting. This proposition is predicated on Marias' strong belief that El Greco left his Byzantine past behind when he left for Venice. Now, as has already been suggested, and as will be discussed in what follows, we may question whether El Greco considered himself to be following the path of Latin painting. And there I'm being very narrow. He's clearly dependent upon the models of contemporary Italian painting. But what I'm interested in is how he chooses to describe those models to himself. How he turns the artistic world he sees into a world that he wishes to identify as something Greek, that it has a Greek quality. And so this is why I want to suggest that we're looking for a Greek path in El Greco's work. So, we need to turn to El Greco's writings to help us out of this, to help us to understand what it is that he says about painting. How does he qualify it? Does the language of Neoplatonism run through his words, or does he try to say something else? In an annotation in his Vitruvius, El Greco writes, and this is the top passage that I'm giving you here, therefore, in regard to architecture, I say that our era does not improve upon the ancients as my Greek fathers did with respect to the Egyptians, but merely imitates them. This appears problematic as our era has witnessed concepts which never belonged to the ancients, and therefore, hopefully, you see what until now has been missing as can be seen in painting and in sculpture. Two points can be drawn from this text. First, he argues that his ancient Greek forebears, mis padres griegos, paralleled the work of the Italian moderns, whom he describes later in the note, in that they shrugged off the legacy of Egyptian art, rather than treating it as a model to be thoughtlessly followed. It is not only his own identification with these ancient Greek fathers, and this is what I want to point us towards, the value he places upon his notion of what the ancient Greeks can do and say that we, we, we need to think with. It, you know, so you know, it's not only his identification with these ancient Greek fathers, but his comparison of them with the moderns who have introduced ideas in painting and sculpture that do not upon, depend upon the ancients. This is what's telling. It gives a model of progress that is Greek, even as it also emphasizes a distance between ancient forms of art and contemporary practice. Second, he argues that while contemporary architecture has been stuck in a model of imitation of ancient architecture, painting and sculpture have created something new. Architecture for El Greco is very significant. He's thinking with it all the time, but he's not impressed by his contemporary architects, but he really values what's happening in painting and in sculpture. So when he turns to painting proper, El Greco introduces a number of important themes. And this is that second passage. Painting is the only form of art where all things through form and color can be judged. Since its objective is the imitation of all these elements. In short, painting is a form of discernment and it shapes all that can be seen. 
And if I could express in words the way a painter views the world, I would say that at first sight it might seem strange to the normal way of seeing things, since vision of all the faculties is particular. But painting, being universal, is speculative, and it is always possible to speculate, because everything there, everything there is to see can be shown, since even in semi-darkness it is possible to make out objects and delight in them. And this must be imitated. This is the true path that leads to correct proportionality. For this, proportionality cannot be reached by mathematics. And again, this is this resistance to that mathematical model. We're taking another route. El Greco here, first of all, defines painting as an imitation by means of form and color of things that can be seen. This process involves and presents acts of judgment or discernment. And while the painter's perception is particular, as vision is an individual faculty, painting itself is both universal and speculative. It is the correlation of the particular and the universal that requires judgment. This is an important theme since it raises painting above the faculty of sight and the simple imitation of objects. Such judgment or discernment insists upon a mental aspect to art making. And it's this combination of the universal and the particular, rather than the simple abstraction of mathematics that provides a correct representation of things seen in the world. Building upon the value he has placed upon the particularity of sight, El Greco's annotations insistently return to the importance of sense perception and the human body in the artistic process. Problem solving in the work lies beyond the work itself. Instead, such problem solving begins from the body of the work's maker. It is the point of view that the artist assumes that challenges the abstract and mathematical order of the idealized body in Vitruvius. For even though El Greco accepts that human proportions are the basis for all beauty, he avers that they must be based on the observation of natural things rather than drawn from a theory. The point is developed in a note in the Vitruvius, and this responds to a passage considering the adjustments necessary to make the elements of a column and a capital legible as their heights increase. Typically, El Greco uses the architectural problem to contemplate painting. As the text is somewhat compromised by trimming to the edge of the page, that's the trimming in that bottom corner that you're seeing there, um, let me summarize the key issues in the annotation. I will also give you what it says, but it's, it's hard to break it apart. What El Greco is doing in this passage is pointing out that the rendering of a man on horseback differs from that of a standing figure. Adjustments need to be made to the amount of room given to the man's beard or cloak so that they may become more prominent. The lips are to be lengthened and their thickness adjusted. The ear must also be lengthened, the shape of the nose sharpened, the forehead increased. In listing these adjustments, El Greco is making the point that a painting is not governed by a single ideal proportion. Rather, it is marked by the endless varieties required by the differing needs of the figures depicted therein. The thought continues on the next page, where El Greco argues that um, idealized systems of proportion cannot adapt when a beautiful woman is considered from a different point of view. We should be looking at that one. Um, no matter how extravagant, and sorry, the guys below are representing the different points of view, um, rather than rendering beauty into monstrosity, El Greco proposes that such other perspectives may enhance the beauty of the subject. Now, although somewhat fragmented, this annotation tells us much about El Greco's conception of visual perception. Vision matters, and vision is situated here in this world, and vision is mediated by the artist. The various points of view that are possible do not distort the object of sight, but actually enhance it, even if it already possesses beauty. 
It is because of the fundamental role that he grants to the human body that El Greco argues in favor of a privileged status for painting. As he writes, painting alone is granted the true judgment of the well-figured human body, whence we take our model for all others. This privileged status for painting is first and foremost built upon color, which is valued for its own properties, and which provides a crucial distinction from the medium of sculpture. In comments appended to the preface to Vitruvius' text, El Greco touches upon these different media. One, that is, painting is the imitation of colors, which I consider the greatest difficulty, that phrase again, as it means deceiving the intelligence with appearances, a natural occurrence. This, the difficulty that follows upon the variety of colors and things, is also shown in the drawings of a single subject or a single object, just as in the sculpture that Michelangelo has perfected. Since the colors have not done any work there, and it is not just the case of Michelangelo, for drawings of the nude are particularly notable in this regard. There are still various opinions not discussed that state that the art that is most difficult will be the most delightful and in consequence the most intellectual. Since I have loved them both, I cannot appear to be contrary to sculpture, but in all honesty, I will say that there has never been a painter who has made an absolutely perfect figure, while in sculpture, even mediocre artists have managed to make one. And this is manifest to the eyes of reason. I will not say that since the task of painting is to achieve the impossible, that it is therefore imperfect, but I do say that while both arts pertain to nature, sculpture is concerned with surfaces alone, while it seems that painting is concerned with everything. It's a particularly rich attempt at grappling with the relationship between painting and sculpture. As Al Greco notes, he loves both painting and sculpture. A somewhat playful sense of the shared affection is manifest in his drawing of Michelangelo's figure of day, a work, by the way, that was owned by Vasari. We are in a very small world. The drawing appears to be based on an unused modello shown from above. The palette is limited, but offers a close study of light and shadow. The drawing was put to use in some of El Greco's paintings, and we also know that El Greco himself was invested in sculpture. These are models that were prepared for him, that he's thinking about sculptural form. Notably, the sculptural form is painted. But despite these engagements with sculpture, in his annotation, El Greco nonetheless posits the superiority of painting. His argument begins by stating that the imitation of colors is the greatest difficulty. It is such because it seeks to deceive the intelligence with the appearance of things. He remarks that, he remarks that the art that is most difficult will be the most delightful and in consequence the most intellectual. He then turns to a somewhat backhanded evaluation of the relative merits of painting and sculpture, assessing that while there has never been a painter who has made an absolutely perfect figure in sculpture, even mediocre artists have managed to make one. The apparent success of sculpture is challenged by this comparison that while both arts pertain to nature, sculpture is concerned with surfaces alone, while it seems that painting is concerned with everything. Therefore, painting, whose task is to achieve the impossible and so remains imperfect, is superior to sculpture because it takes us beyond the surface to everything else. This quality of striving, this definition of painting, harkens back to the implications of El Greco's signature which signals that the work of art is not always an achieved thing, but is rather always in the process of becoming. In choosing to wander off the Byzantine path, El Greco found his way towards a distinctively Greek articulation for contemporary 16th century painting. When we look at this beautiful rendering of the Holy Family with the Magdalene, we are looking at what was for El Greco a Greek painting. In part, this is because it is the work of an artist whom we tend to identify as the Greek and who chose to sign such works in Greek. But as we've also seen, this Greek identity is not without implications. To begin with, he was born in Venetian Crete and spent the greater part of his life away from that island. You may have noticed that his annotations were written in a somewhat faltering Castilian. Nonetheless, he presents a persistent commitment to a Greek identity that is closely bound to his self-definition as an artist. 
the usual form of the signature pointed towards a far distant Greek origin in the work of Apelles. For El Greco, this was a better foundation for modern art, as it was understood, uh, uh, for, modern, for the modern art as it was understood in the later 16th century, far better than Vasari's choice of that limited artist Giotto. El Greco did not recognize the ingenious difficulties of late mannerism in the mathematical abstractions of the Tuscan tradition that Vasari had threaded from Giotto to Michelangelo. Rather, in his strong advocacy of modern art, which was primarily shaped by Italian concerns and by his Venetian and Roman experiences, he develops a notion of a Greek manner that is, a more, adequ that is more adequate than the Latin manner proposed by Vasari. This manner was not predicated upon his Byzantine training, even if glimpses of this remained within him throughout his life. Instead, it was founded upon those Greek fathers who had first defined the language for art, the sources that Vitruvius and Pliny the Elder made Latin. It was manifest in the material pleasures of color, variety of points of view, the bodies of subject, artist, and viewer. It is a profoundly human art. It is not a mystical art. It is an art that begins from the eyes of the artist looking at the world from different perspectives. These are evident in our painting where we find color and line building upon and around the bodies of the painting subject. These are variously posed and coloristically distinguished, each playing a part that contributes to a fragmentary whole. This, for El Greco, manifests his conception of an arte moderna greca, an alternative path to the genealogy and the constraints of Vasari's arte moderna latina. It is the insistent note struck by the signature on his paintings that continues to signal this identity. For even as this migrant artist left the world of the icon painter far behind, he nonetheless forged a Greek manner in word and in deed. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for a intellectually extremely ins inspiring uh, lecture and I think I have to at least it's for me, digest this new perspectives on, um, on El Greco, and um, I think it op opened for me new, completely new aspects. Thank you very much for this. And so to conclude this afternoon, it's my honor to, to look f ahead to next year's, uh, the upcoming Dr. John and Helen Collins lecture, and you already see the slide here, which uh, then chronologically it goes back and um, to um, antiquity and uh, accordingly the title is The Art of Antiquity, Objects and Their Biographies from the Athenian Agora. And the speaker will be John K. Papadopoulos, a professor of classics at UCLA and um, uh, saved the date, September 29, 2024. And um, I think we all look forward to seeing you then next year uh, for, the, uh, for the upcoming college lecture. Thank you very much for coming this afternoon and have a nice rest of your Sunday. Thank you.